even though you might think that it's it's a bummer to get to get that news that oh you have that that rare genetic condition that is very difficult to treat and we will never cure it in probably in your lifetime it's actually very reassuring because it answers it makes my whole life make sense you know i got, I got one statement that makes everything make sense and my whole life just kind of fell into place and that is very comforting in its own way this is fat science a podcast dedicated to the science of why we get fat no diets no agendas just science that makes you feel better this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to replace professional medical advice i'm dr emily cooper I've been treating patients with metabolic issues for over 25 years. I'm on a mission to raise awareness about metabolic dysfunction and why diets don't work. Hi, I'm Andrea Taylor. I've been fat, very fat, chubby, morbidly obese, and done almost every diet ever invented. They all worked until they didn't. I've known Dr. Cooper forever, but when I became her patient and we learned metabolism was the real problem, wow, everything changed and I've never been healthier. And I'm Mark Wright. It's time for Fat Science. Wait, does this podcast make me look fat? Welcome to Fat Science. I'm Mark Wright, along with Andrea Taylor, Dr. Emily Cooper, and one of Dr. Cooper's patients, Heather. It's great to have all of you here. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. So on the show today, we're talking about genetic obesity. So Dr. Cooper, I'd love it if you could just kind of set the table because I'm confused. When I hear genetic obesity, I think, oh, somebody has the gene, so then they become obese. But it's it's a lot more complicated than that. And I think I probably didn't do that justice. But what is genetic obesity? Yeah, it is. It's Well, now it's pretty widely accepted that obesity in general is primarily hereditary genetic, based on um, genetic heritability. And so that has to do with the inheritance of multiple different genetic factors that make somebody more susceptible toward obesity. And that's referred to as common obesity or polygenic obesity. And that makes up the, what we think is the majority of obesity. Um, but then there's another type of genetic obesity, which is less common, and sometimes it's actually referred to as rare obesity, although as genetic testing is becoming more and more readily available and more and more advanced, we're beginning to understand it's not maybe as rare as we thought um, because it's being detected a little bit easier than it used to be. So when we're talking about these more uncommon forms, though that is referred to as monogenic obesity. So the common form polygenic, where you inherit lots of different variables that increase your susceptibility. The other is referred to as monogenic, where there really is one specific genetic, I, I don't I hate to say defect, but mutation <laughs> um, that mm -hmm. really interrupts your ability to, uh, for your body to function normally, metabolically, and to maintain a normal weight on its own. So when you talk about polygenic obesity, there, you know, we've talked in the past how absolutely complicated the metabolic loop is. So we're talking many, many different parts of the body affected, and the end result is metabolic dysfunction or something yes, like that? Yes, yes. Um, it, well, it's also things like the polygenic can increase your susceptibility. Say um, you start out and you're exposed to like medications that can aggravate your insulin levels or jack up your ghrelin levels or you're exposed to environmental endocrine disruptors, if you have that genetic predisposition, you're going to be much more affected than someone who doesn't. So those kind of things can act as triggers in your body where somebody who doesn't have that those polygenic factors in their genetic makeup, they won't necessarily react that way. And then the other thing is if you have monogenic obesity, where there is a specific genetic mutation that's really disrupting the metabolic function, that doesn't mean you can't also have polygenic on top of it. You can. You can have other inherited uh, variables that also make you susceptible to just common obesity as well. So could you basically do a genetic test or when you have a, a or you look at a baby and say, okay, we got a fat one, <laughs> or do you say, um, or do you just say, oh, this baby is 
prone to being obese? How does that work? Well, that's a great question. You know, the thing is, first of all, what are we going to do with this information? That's something that does concern me a little bit because even if we could test all our babies that seem to be out of proportion, if we could- <laughs> Right, what do yeah, you do? And then would we tell, would we do the wrong thing? Um, because mm -hmm. I think people's well, instinct yeah. is, oh my gosh, you've got this genetic problem that puts you at risk, so we better starve you. Um, right, don't give that baby any <laughs> formula. Don't give that baby Right, a so my concern is that I don't think we've evolved enough to trust ourselves with what we would do with that information with children. Um, mm. I think we need a lot more knowledge um, about metabolism and about what it really means to have these genetic problems. But in any case, you can obtain genetic testing now for some of the known variables that are out there. But we have to keep in mind what we know is a fraction of what is really there. <laughs> but part of it is that the genetic testing used to be very cumbersome and take forever to actually, you know, run a test on someone's genes and was very expensive, you know, 10 to $20,000. Right. Mm -hmm. Now the cost has come down dramatically and the time it takes has sped up like incredibly. So now it's really becoming much more practical to obtain genetic testing in clinical environments. So we're, but We've identified some, and I say we, not me, but scientists have identified a lot of the genes um, and understand what some of these genes do, but not, you know, again, just a fraction. And then even when they do understand what they do, they may not understand how they do it. <laughs> so there's really a very small number of very clear mutations that they really know for sure affect a specific thing, um, you know, when it's compared to the vast array that we, we want to know about. So although we can do the testing, we have to keep in mind when we get the testing back, you'll have different results. And um, the results fall into different categories. One is it's benign and they know it is. They know that this person's genes demonstrate that everything should function normally based on how it looks. Or it might say it's likely pathogenic, which means it's suspected to be a risk that it really is potentially able to cause um, disruption and normal function. Or it could come back saying pathogenic, which is we know for sure this is creating dysfunction. And then the last one, which is actually, unfortunately, the most common is it comes back saying, this is a variant of uncertain significance, <laughs> which, <laughs> or indeterminate, <laughs> meaning we have no idea and we're still gathering information. So, so that's where it's genetic testing is today. So Heather, you started seeing Dr. Cooper about 10 years ago. I'd love to know a little bit more about your life story and how you got to that point of coming to Dr. Cooper. Oh my gosh, that's a story. How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was born to um, two lovely people in the northern Midwest um, at a, in a very tiny town um, on the Illinois-Wisconsin state line. Uh, ancestry is, is mostly northern European, you know, all of the UK and you know, a little bit of Danish. Uh, that's pretty much some Dutch, you know, so very, probably very common for that part of the country. And um, I started out very normal. I was born a baby with a very typical weight. And I was, and my mom put it, I was a healthy with a baby with a healthy appetite, but nothing excessive or unusual. I liked, um, she, she was very pleased that I liked vegetables and, you know, <laughs> like the bitter flavors. Like I took on bitter flavors unusually early. And so I was, uh, she considered me a pretty easy baby from that regards, Um and it wasn't until I was about six years old that I started to gain weight. You know, up to that point, I was a very high energy kid running around with all the other kids. And I've got this great picture that my dad scanned from old photos that he sent to me where it must be, I must be like five, maybe five and a half. And I'm like lanky and tall for my age, but I'm starting to develop like this little pot belly. 
you know, and, and I've got this like ruddy face, you know, and it's, I think that that was like the first signs that something was about to, to start going very wrong. And it was at that point about age six, when I just started packing on pounds and there were some well-intended adults that tried to intervene very aggressively. Um, I was put on a number of very aggressive starvation diets, both before puberty and after puberty, um, that probably did some some pretty severe damage to to my body. And uh, I ended up reaching about 300 pounds at 17. You know, so and that was despite lots of very aggressive attempts to prevent that. Then um, when I got into college, I gained some agency in terms of control of my own diet and and what I was doing with my own time. And reflecting back, I, I was actually eating more, but eating better and exercising more. And I started to lose more weight and I got down to about 250 or so. But then after I got out of college, started a job, very high stress, pulling lots of all-nighters, you know, as tech workers tend to do. And so, you know, go through the next 20 or so years. And it was just, you know, successive periods of very rapid weight gain and then a stall, maybe a little bit of weight loss and then rapid weight gain and just follow that cycle. And then by the time I reached out to Dr. Cooper, I was at 375 and feeling like I had no control over my body at all. Um, I was terrified to eat carbs because it seemed like if I looked at a, even looked at a bagel, you know, boom, five pounds on my body <laughs> just appeared out of mm. nowhere. And that's pretty much what brought me to Dr. Cooper. And it wasn't until I started working with her that my body and its behaviors finally started to make sense. I can relate to the well-meaning adults mm-hmm. and the up and downs with like, what the hell is going on here? Mm -hmm. Um, And the smelling of food. And like, did I just gain weight from smelling a piece of cake? I don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. Yep. (laughs) Um, And, and not understanding, like, why is it happening to me? Like everybody else seems to be eating just like normal and not gaining 10 pounds in a week. And like, what happened here? Mm -hmm. Um, And It just doesn't make it, and you walk around going, it doesn't make sense. And you think about it when you wake up, you think about it when you go to sleep, you think about it all the, like in your, in your waking hours, in your relaxing hours, it just creeps in. And it's a terrible thing because it, it stops you from doing a lot of things Uh that you don't realize until you, until it changes oh my God, that really did affect a lot of stuff. It really did Mm kind of, kind of go in there and you, you don't realize it until it stops. And I mean, for me, it took, you know, 50 years for it to change. (laughs) And when it changed, it was like, oh, yeah. And major change. mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, 36, 37, um, deprivation diets later, I have a very different attitude toward food and it's so freeing because I happen to love food. I love really good food. Mm -hmm. I love eating and I never was a glutton. Mm -hmm. I mean, never. And you know that when you walk into a room, everyone's going, oh my God, hide the food. She's going to eat it all. And you just know that that's everyone's attitude and it really, it doesn't feel great. And you know that when you walk into a doctor's office, that's what they're thinking too. Absolutely. Even if they want to help you. Mm -hmm. Heather, I'm curious, did your parents have weight issues and were you sort of blamed by the doctors when the weight wasn't coming off? That's a great question. My mom has struggled with her weight her whole life. And I would love to have more pictures of her as a child. I have one of her when she was around the age that I started to gain weight and we look very similar. You know, uh, and so I have a feeling that I'm following in her in her shoes genetically. But my dad, he's more maybe a you might call it a victim of Western affluence. You know, he was a skinny kid and a skinny adult until he hit his mid 30s. You know, and then you know the ravages of time start to set in, and then he starts started to gain weight just from you know getting old, I guess. You know, getting older. Um, but but no real. I wouldn't say that he had anything uh, genetic going on there. Um, so, 
Um, but definitely think it came from my mom. You have brothers and sisters? Um, so I have one brother and he's five years younger than me. And um, he rolled well in the genetic lottery. Uh, he doesn't have any weight issues at all. <laughs> It just shows you. It just shows you how genetics like can play such a big part and skip things and everyone is right. so different. Mm -hmm. You know, it really does show you how different things are. And as we say, like when you're working with Dr. Cooper and when you're trying to do things, how everyone's metabolism is different mm -hmm. and how, you know, like I have friends who, you know, we're all doing different programs and different things and we're on different sets of drugs. It's all different. Yep. Like everyone's got a different issue. Our bodies are so different. It would be so great if there was like a blanket medication. Like your problem is different from my problem. It's different from Mark's problem. Mm -hmm. It's different from everybody's. Mm -hmm. It's it's really sad that we can't just have one little vitamin pill that we could. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to get to Dr. Cooper, but first, Heather, do, what what did the doctors tell you back then? Oh my gosh. Um, well, clearly it was my fault. You know, clearly I was just eating candy bars, you know, and, and not eating my vegetables. It's like, wait a minute, I love vegetables. You know, <laughs> what are you talking about? Mm. Um, and you know, so that's, uh, the first diet that I was put on, I was 12 and it was a 900 calorie diabetic exchange diet. And, um, I remember when the doctor gave me the, the meal plan, and, and I looked at it and breakfast was supposed to be one hard boiled egg and, and a thin slice of, of um, plain whole wheat toast and black coffee. And I, I looked at the doctor and I said, uh, I'm a kid. I'm 12. I don't drink coffee. <laughs> and he looked at it and he says, well, you can drink water. And, and if you get really hungry, you can have a, a, a half of a slice of grapefruit, but not a whole grapefruit. grapefruit. You can only have a half. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, but, but I was a, I was a good kid, you know, I wanted to be obedient. And so I did my best, you know, anytime I was given one of these ridiculous diets, I would try very hard to follow them. And, um, I would usually make it about six to eight weeks before, um, the, the organism would, would step up and say, okay, you're being ridiculous and, and you're going, you're, you're putting us in peril. So I'm going to step in and, um, turn up the signal so strongly that you can't help but resist and, and eat because you're not eating. And of course, at that point, when that happened, um, that was my fault. That was a lack of willpower. And I was just, uh, I didn't want it bad enough. Right. Mm. Um, so that was, I heard that one over and over and over again. Uh, when I became an adult, uh, the thing that was the recurring theme is I would go to a, a, see a new doctor and didn't matter what I was going to see the doctor for, you know, it might be because I had a sore throat. It might be because, you know, I had a pain in my foot. The first thing that they hand me is a pamphlet for gastric bypass surgery. And they wanted to know if I'd heard about this amazing procedure, you know, like I'm completely ignorant and maybe I'd never thought about the fact that I'm obese and might have a, and it, you know, might want to take care of that. And, um, I, I became very blunt after a while, you know, it's, you know, a doctor hands me the pamphlet and, you know, I just kind of look at it and I look at them and I said, well, I'm actually here for a sore throat. And if you don't feel qualified to treat a sore throat, then I'm going to leave now and I'm going to go find a doctor who can. So. Yeah, uh, <laughs> well, let's that bring Dr. Cooper guts, in. Though. Yeah. No kidding. That took a lot of guts. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Dr. Cooper, what a heartbreaking story that Heather had to go through yeah. all that. When you first saw her, what happened? Well, if you just listen to the story, there's a lot of kind of um, clues in there. And it's highly suspicious that there is some type of potential monogenic obesity gene mutation that could be detected. Because um, with monogenic obesity, usually the onset is before age 10, usually around that age of like, you know, even sometimes it's down at age two, three, four, five, six. Um, and there's, you know, all, it's very linked to rapid weight regain with every attempt to like lose weight, like even more extreme than what most dieters experience. And so... Um, I think right away we were kind of suspicious, but I don't mm -hmm. remember how long it took us to like get the genetic testing because there was a special program that we were able to tap into 
for the testing. And the testing looked for like 90 different um, potential genetic mutations along what's called the melanocortin pathway, which is really just the pathway in the brain that we always talk about with the metabolic feedback loop. There's the, the part where the signals are received by the brain and processed. And as a result of that, that's what really determines your body weight set point, your appetite, like your satiety, your insulin levels. And so, you know, by, by a series of chemical reactions that occur within the brain. And so this particular genetic testing looked at 90 different potential mutation areas within the gene profile that would affect that melanocortin pathway. And, um, and so, you know, right away, we're kind of thinking better, this has that flavor, even though we also wondered, or it could just be that you were put on diets from an early age. And I think, Heather, you didn't mention about, you know, your mom having been on diets. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yep. Even, you know, when pregnant and things like that. And so, um, <laughs> so that is known that, you know, that type of environment could also just impair metabolism and have caused a lot of this problem if in a person that had that genetic susceptibility, even without the monogenic obesity. But we were, we were determined to get the genetic testing. So we got that done. And then it was like, oh, guess what? <laughs> you actually do have a very specific uh, form of monogenic obesity. Well, what do you do? First of all, I think it's very interesting that you said that there were 90 different markers and it's not just one single like, oh, look, here's the genetic mutation. It's just the one thing. It's You found 90 different, like the, you went through 90 different things. That's like, oh my God. Um, and there's more. I remember you telling me at one point there's more than that, yes. which is like mind boggling to me. Um, I know that there's lots of things in DNA. I know that I did kind of take that class, but I, not really. And so that's amazing. But how do you treat a patient with this problem? Like, what do you do? What are the next steps? What happens? Well, yeah, it was, you know, it used to be, I mean, it, it has been a big mystery to physicians and researchers of what you do if you if you find something like this. And the specific gene mutation that Heather has is it's called the melanocortin 4 receptor deficiency, MC4R. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> if you think, I always think of the melanocortin 4 receptor as like just the bullseye of metabolism. I mean, you have, in order to have your metabolism operate really efficiently and, you know, have your weight in proportion, your appetite normal, all of this, it really relies so much on the melanocortin-4 receptor. Um, and that is the final step within the melanocortin pathway is to activate that receptor. So all these preceding reactions, the goal is that they carry you forward, carry you forward, carry you forward till you are in a position where you're right in front of that receptor with these signals and it activates them. So when you have a genetic mutation that affects your melanocortin-4 receptor, that's just really severe. Um, and well, how do you activate it? <laughs> well, when you, this type of thing is autosomal dominant. And so that means What's that, that mean? there, there's one, in this case, there was, you know, out of the pairs of our, our chromosomes, um, chromosome 18 is where this mutation is, was located for Heather. And so she inherited one, uh, set of genes on that chromosome that was, uh, had a mutation, which is called a frame shift mutation. So it sounds technical, but it's kind of interesting. And a frame shift mutation, all it does is it makes it difficult for the cell to read the genetic code to make the protein um, because it, it interrupts the normal sequence by either inserting an extra little message or deleting a message and it gets completely disrupted so that whatever that gene was coding for, it, it just starts the process of coding for that, for, I mean, for that protein and then abruptly stops because it's like it ran, it, it ran out of instruction. 
prematurely. And so that's what this mutation is. And the MC4 receptor mutation is the most common um, monogenic uh, mutation that occurs, but even being the most common, it's only responsible for 2% of genetic mono, you know, of genetic obesity, 2% in people that you might find as adults that, that have a 40 or higher BMI, but had childhood onset obesity. You take that group and isolate that group because that's the group that you're most likely to find this in. It's still only responsible for 2% and it's the most common one. So, so you could see it's kind of crazy to think about these numbers, but but what do you do about it? Well, you think, okay, what does it mean? It means that you inherited one set of these receptors that don't work. Half your receptors don't work. They don't, they're there, but they can't receive the signal. And the other set of receptors does function normally. So you really have no choice but to try to bolster your system so that the areas that you have that function normally will function better, basically. So you can improve the function of that metabolic pathway, not just at that receptor level, but even for those steps leading up to the activation of your healthy receptors. And so right now, that's the only really way to, to treat something like this. We do not have a specific medication that can just turn on the faulty receptors. Although there probably are medications that can, not, not that we have available to us necessarily today, but um, it, it's possible that we, we may have some of these, these medications out there, but they're not available to even try in this particular case due to like maybe insurance issues or um, but there are things in the pipeline that are being developed that in the future, there probably will be something that you could give a child who has this that would be kind of like correcting the issue potentially, you know, but we're definitely far from that right now. But what was great is, you know, once you start doing some of this genetic testing and you see that some people have these like really severe genetic mutations, I mean, that just means that you have to be on lifelong treatment for this. I mean, it's not going to repair by itself. Um, but once you see this and you see that the tools in our toolbox actually can help in spite of the severity of the, the problem, it's kind of miraculous. So um, I've been really inspired by it. I think our practice has maybe uh, about eight patients uh, that have this particular mutation. And as a whole, the group is doing pretty well as a whole, but not, not every person in the group's doing as well as we'd like. But, but considering this is a condition that was thought to not be treatable, it it's clearly is treatable even with the tools we have today. So is her metabolism system pathway or whatever basically saying, don't let go of fat, bring it back on? Yeah. It's, because we think she's starting. Yes, it is because the melanocortin receptors are the ones that determine your weight set point, your satiety. And so if only half of them work, I always imagine it as though if half of them work, maybe your brain can only see half your weight. Maybe your brain can only see half your food. You know, I kind of see it that way. It's probably not right. like that, but mm -hmm. but it's a good way to imagine it. Like, and so that's why also the weight regain in this group after losing weight is extreme. Um, that has been well documented that weight loss maintenance, you know, it's hard for anybody. We don't believe anyone who goes on diets can have weight loss maintenance, <laughs> but this is even more extreme. This is like, if you lose a certain amount of weight, you can gain weight so rapidly after that. And it's almost so. Heather's, yeah, go ahead. Like Heather's body thought, "Oh my God, she's dying. We need to fatten her up because she's going to die yeah. if she's so skinny." It's true. Um, I really do feel like it is that way, and I've actually seen it clinically in some of our patients that um, once the weight goes to a certain level, it can just shoot up like at a blink of an eye, forty pounds. I mean, it's. Right, because they she lost so much weight that they, her body like didn't see it and thought she was too skinny. Yes, exactly. Wow. So Heather, what is life like today now that you've been treated by Dr. Cooper for the past ten years? Uh, it's, it, 
it's been completely transformed, right? I think I'm sitting around, I don't know, what is it, 260 or so, I think, you know, pounds wise, you know, which is, um, we've lost over 100 pounds, you know, since we've started working together. I know that's where we're at. I, reason why I'm I'm kind of fudging on it is because I'm not supposed to be keeping track, right? right. We're not supposed to be, <laughs> we we're don't not, talk numbers. That's right. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> we're not supposed to talk the numbers until we have to. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah, I think I'm sitting somewhere around, yeah, like, like 262. Um, and socially speaking, uh, that seems to be a weight where you might get a couple of people that'll give you the stink eye, but, but most people will, you know, they probably have somebody in their extended family that is roughly that size. And so it's, it's familiar enough to them that they don't really give you a second look. So I can peacefully move through the world without too much harassment. Um, and, and those that, that kind of harass me, that they, amuse and sadden me at the same time because you know it's oh you're cute um but it also saddens me because their worldview is just so small you know they have they're so ignorant they have no idea what's going on and they have zero interest in learning anything about me Mm -hmm. and people like me you know and and i know that i have no way of reaching them so you know but um you know that's why you guys are doing podcasts like this you know hopefully hopefully they'll find this someday and you know they'll listen to it um i obviously have a lot more energy um and i have a lot more i have a much better relationship with food um i never hated food the way you know i know some folks develop a a resentment of food um i'm very blessed with a with a rational mind i got i think i got that from my dad and, and so, you know, from a very young age, it was very clear to me um, what I am doing is not adding up to the outcome. And so I never, I mean, I never blamed food for that. I knew that there was just something else going on, even if I didn't understand it. So um, when I say that my relationship with food has changed, it's more, I don't fear it anymore, right? Mm-hmm. It's not, oh, if I if I decide to have a bagel for breakfast this morning, I'm, I'm not fearful that I'm going to gain 15 pounds next week because I've, I've triggered an adverse reaction in my body that I don't fully understand. So, so that's fantastic. Um, and, and I, I also, I just, I, it's very, even though you might think that it's, it's a bummer to get, to get that news that, Oh, you have that, that rare genetic condition that is very difficult to treat and we will never cure it in probably in your lifetime. It's actually very reassuring because it answers, it makes my whole life make sense. You know, I got, I got one statement that makes everything make sense. And my whole life just kind of fell into place. And that is very comforting in its own way. I would think it's very freeing it is. to know that all those years of like, I'm not doing anything that I shouldn't be doing. Mm-hmm. It's not my fault. Like when you learn that it's not your fault, it's like, it's like a weight, literal, a literal weight has been lifted from your body. And you know that you were doing it right. You're you know that you did it right. Mm-hmm. And it's it's freed me up um, to start extending, finding and extending compassion to people who don't understand obesity and, and who are, don't extend kindness to the obese. Um, it, it's I was never mean spirited, uh, but I would instead have if somebody made fun of me, you know, or if they made a, a scathing remark towards me. Um, I would have this internal reaction that was hyper defensive. It was, you don't know me and you don't know my situation and you don't know how hard I work and you don't know what I've been fighting and and you don't understand that my body is in chaos, you know, and I would end up, you know, it, it's the person I've left them behind 10 minutes ago and I'm still talking to them in my head. Right. And having that understanding of, of why things are the way that they are, I don't do that anymore. You know, instead, I can just understand, I I can look at it instead of entirely from my point of view, I can try to understand it from their point of view. Again, it's they they don't understand. They don't have the knowledge. It's it's not widely communicated out there in the world that that Mm -hmm. obesity is largely genetically driven. And um, that's sad, you know, and and so it's really helped me to be um, to, to feel more connected, you know, with with, you know, people, you know, with people in society in general. Heather, I think the amazing thing about your story. By the way, you look fantastic. You look healthy right now. Thank you. And 
the fact that you've shared your story, I think is we need to share more stories like yours because there is so much judgment out there with people struggling with obesity. And you're right. They have no idea. And yet there's this perception that, oh, they just have a lack of willpower. And it's it's just tragic that so many people still feel that. So we're super grateful that you came on, super excited that you're you're headed toward your goal and, and uh, life is good. And I just love Dr. Cooper. In summary, what, what, what have we learned from Heather in, in today's episode? I would say that it's really the luck of the draw, you know, and, and Heather's family demonstrates it because as she said, her brother, completely normal weight. And this type of autosomal dominant gene mutation, there's a 50% chance of passing it to your offspring with each pregnancy. So it's just, unfortunately, those are the cards, you know, that Heather was dealt. And um, I think it's true about just trying to raise awareness in the community about the fact that we've got to get away from the stigma around higher body weight and kind of spark people's curiosity about metabolism in general and you know, now with the onset of genetic science, it's, I mean, it's amazing um, what they're really learning. And I feel like everyone should be, should be aware of it because it kind of, it, you could just be in awe of, of science <laughs> and, and also grateful for if you're not affected by these things and feel not that it's not because you did something so wonderful and you ate the right foods and you exercised. It's because you were lucky. You were lucky. You had, you know, uh, a luckier chance when your genes <laughs> were passed to you that you didn't have to experience mm. the difficulties that people like Heather and Andrea have had to. Yeah. Well, We've talked about genetic obesity. Uh, it's real. There are tests that can uncover it, and there are treatments that can treat it. So Dr. Cooper, Heather, Andrea, thank you to all of you for bringing this story to light today. I think it's a super important one. Thanks. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you. You bet. No diets, no agendas, just science that makes you feel better. I'm Mark Wright. Thanks for listening to Fat Science with Dr. Emily Cooper, a work P2P production. New episodes drop every Monday. If you've enjoyed the conversation, subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. This production is for informational purposes only and is not intended to replace professional medical advice. Join us next week for another episode dedicated to the science of why we get fat. No diets, no agendas, just science that makes you feel better.